Well, for me, it's a great opportunity to meet other dentists. Um, it helps me in, in my practice, plus I learn quite a bit from what Keith is teaching the rest of us. Yeah, it's very practical and effective because on the lecture, we're really studying actual patients that we are referring. Dr. Cooper decided to educate the general dentist on the, the correct way to do implant restorative treatment. I've been at least six of his lectures. It's uh, the benefits of his lectures of, he has so much information that I haven't been aware of in the last uh, 10 years of implant uh, uh, placement. This patient presented with chief complaint that her general dentist referred her because she had periodontal disease, just bone loss. She's missing a number of teeth. There's recent extraction in this area and an immediate couple days earlier extraction in this area. And the first thing the lady said to me was, she said, I really like to keep my teeth if I can. Let's quickly go through the ideas, okay? We really don't have a lot of tooth decay. We do have a lot of perio. What have we lost? Posterior support. Where's all that occlusion right there? The bone defect was so great that there's not enough bone to put implants there. You, could, you cannot do immediate placement. It will require socket graft and a sinus lift to put implants in these areas. The explanation that we give to patients in our office is that it used to be a tent and now the tent is gone. So when the molars are in the sinus, there's a tent pole holding up the tent. And when the tent falls down, when the tent pole comes out, the tent falls down. What are we gonna do? We're gonna lift the tent back up and fill that tent full of bone. It's gonna be like a new roof on the tent, it's gonna fill up with bone, and then we're gonna have bone to put the implant in just like the tooth used to be in. Our big problem is right here, and right here. So, real quickly, let's treat implants together. You guys ask me questions, tell me what you wanna do, what's your thought process? A lot of times we talk to the patient about, these teeth have been keeping the bone in place that you're gonna need for your implants. What do the teeth look like? Where is the ideal tooth position for eight and nine? What's the closest speaking space? Where's the occlusal plane? How many of you routinely do closest speaking space on people with teeth? I'll bet you nobody does. Well, I want to send you back. This is your new quest. Next time I talk to you, I want you to tell me, hey, when I did that exam on the patient with teeth, I actually noticed that they only had one millimeter of speaking space in their premolars when they counted from 60 to 70, or they said Mississippi three times. I love telling people to say Mississippi three times. I've only had one person say Mississippi three times. <laughs> Why are we doing that? We're trying to see closest speaking space. See this case, you gotta think outside the box sometimes, but it's really not outside the box, it's taking your basics and going back and just looking at that list of things. Okay, where do the teeth go? Where's the vertical dimension? Where's the occlusal plane? All that basic stuff we learned in dentures, we don't think about with crown and bridge patients, but you need to. So, any questions about fixed over here? What's the mobility and fitting depth of this? Yeah. They're extremely borderline. You gotta decide whether you're gonna put implants here only or implants all the way across here. And if you are, what are you gonna do for temporary? She doesn't want removable and she's emotionally attached to those teeth. So, you guys have to think really hard. What do you guys say? Questions? You're gonna break the chief complaint, you're gonna give her something removable. So what do you guys want to do? You want to take out all the upper teeth or you want to leave the molars? That's pretty much your decision, right? Okay.